uh, thanks everybody for coming. You're probably wondering like, what is this last session? And I, I wanted to announce it before lunch, but it's great that, that most of you have stuck around. So this last session and the goal of these workshops in general is to sort of, um, I, Doug and I are sort of the academic leads on the project. And this first year is called an inception year. So what's an inception year? Um, it's a, well, the STEG is gonna be a five year uh, program, potentially nine year program, but uh, the funders, uh, um, FCDO, uh, it just changed the name, so I have to correct my, my mind, um, <clears throat> wants us to spend the first year sort of figuring out a lay of the land before we start giving out money uh, for research. And so um, this first year is an inception year, and it really has two goals. One is really to improve and inform the research strategy so we can uh, write the correct calls, so we can guide our decisions about what gets funded by knowing um, what's out there in terms of research and uh, what we know, what we don't know. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one of the goals, and one of the goals of this uh, workshop and these, these series of workshops for these teams. Um, a second uh, goal is to really establish ties uh, with the relevant academic researchers, uh, which again, that's something we're trying to do, and also to establish some ties with key policy makers to make sure that we're addressing questions that are policy relevant. So that's what this inception year is about. And uh, so I'm going to present a pathfinding paper, and we're going to discuss the pathfinding paper, which is going to be on a narrow topic. And then after that, we're going to broaden the topic out. So it's really just going to be a conversation. And I would be very interested in hearing from all of you about what you think is the interesting research. You know, not <laughs> would you fund my proposal, but what kind of topics do you think are the most relevant, especially for developing countries uh, around this theme, focused on this theme of firms, uh, frictions and spillovers and industrial policy? and thinking about investment as well. Um, so <clears throat> as part of the inception year, we have commissioned what's called pathfinding papers. And that's what I'm gonna present to you next, uh, a draft of a pathfinding paper. And a pathfinding paper is an attempt to establish again, what we know, what we don't know, and what we need to know about a particular topic. So the particular topic that I'm gonna go into is financial development, and firms and financial frictions. Uh, these pathfinding papers are, are deep dives into a particular topic, but they're not really a true literature review in the sense that they're not as comprehensive in terms of what's been, you know, every, citing every paper on the, t on the subject. Uh, they're much stronger element of, tr again, trying to get a, a, a feel for the frontier and an element of agenda setting of what's interesting going forward. Um, they're intended for a mixed audience. So they're largely non-technical narrative. Uh, and this involves everybody involved with STEG, uh, of course, Doug and, and uh, me in particular, but also, you know, I put DFID in there. I'm sorry, that should be FCDO, that's their new name, uh, and academics, policymakers, um, et cetera. We have 10 of these pathfinding papers on a variety of topics. Uh, they cover, a, a, you know, it's, it's broad, like I said, a broad coverage they don't necessarily have a one-to-one -one correspondence to the theme. So this theme, for example, is much broader than the, the pathfinding paper that I will present. Um, they are deep dives. Again, the set, even as a set, it's not comprehensive of Steg's interests. Uh, so I just want to get you a sense of what this pathfinding paper is, because obviously it's going to be very different than like a research paper. Okay, so here goes. It's financial frictions, financial market development, and macroeconomic development. Um, the motivation, uh, poor countries tend to have lower levels of financial development. In advanced economies, private credit to GDP averages 86%. If we add in the bond and the stock markets, we get over 100% of GDP the financial sector accounts for. You go into low and even low and middle income countries, uh, much lower levels. So in private credits, 0.31. Bo stock and bond markets are particularly underdeveloped. So when you add that in, it doesn't increase much at all from 0.31 to 0.38, obviously much lower. There's a, a long run question about causation. 
Uh, how much does finance follow development? How much does finance lead to development? And through what channels? Um, we're going to focus, this paper is going to focus mostly on firms. Uh, financial frictions can uh, constrain firms uh, through their, by constraining their investment, uh, affecting their cash flow management, and limiting their growth. Uh, so the outline of what I'm going to do, I'm going to quantify, I'm going to talk about quantifying the macro impacts of financial frictions. How big of an issue is this that we're discussing at the macro level? I'm going to talk a little about, about data needs and, uh, and resources for future research. And then again, there's an agenda setting component to all of this. And so I'm going to discuss some avenues for future research that I see. And hopefully Juan and uh, Emily will uh, tell me both more uh, research that I need to be aware of, but also what are some other great uh, avenues to be looking at in this area. Um, can't see the top of my slides. Let me see if I can move that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in this first topic of quantifying the macro uh, impacts of financial frictions, there are a lot of different channels of potential benefits of financial development. Uh, financial development can mobilize savings. It can uh, reallocate capital to the most productive investments. Obviously, that's probably its biggest role. Um, it can facilitate uh, trade uh, when finance is needed for, for working capital and trade credit and other sorts of things. Uh, intermediaries can play a special role in financial development uh, by pooling information, um, pooling resources, providing uh, liquidity. Um, securities markets uh, can also play a special role. They can allow for broader diversification, allow for easier risk uh, mediation. And um, financial markets, uh, both intermediaries and security markets, uh, and financial development can exert uh, monitoring and corporate control. So financial markets basically allow to separate ownership from management, um, and and uh, that's an equalizing force in the sense that you don't have to be wealthy to start a business now. So equalizing in the socioeconomic sense, um, but once you separate ownership from management, uh, you still need to exert sort of monitoring and corporate control, and uh, financial markets can act. Uh, on that front as well. So these are all sort of benefits. We also know there's some downsides to financial development can lead to, any, I, I mentioned it as a potential equalizing force, but it can also be a very uh, unequalizing force. Uh, it can also lead to macroeconomic fragilities, et cetera. So these are sort of the big uh, benefits and potential issues of financial development. Um, what are the macro impacts? There's uh, an older literature, especially, but but it's it's still current. There's still you know new papers coming out in this that uses a reduced form empirical analysis, uh, showing basically the causation that goes from financial development to economic development, and a lot of this is cross country, cross state studies, um, and um, I'll just give you a, a flavor of some of these things. Financial depth uh, predicts future growth. That's King and Levine's. Uh, seminal paper. Uh, so, you know, you use the initial levels of financial development, you produce uh, future growth. Of course, there's potential that the financial markets themselves are forward looking. So, just uh, Granger causing might not be true causality. Uh, so, Rajan and Zingales have a paper where they, again, a cross country study where they show that uh, finance yields a comparative advantage for. Uh, externally financial dependent industries. Um, uh, Jayaratni and Strahan show that state level banking liberalization, uh, so in terms of bank branching, uh, increased incomes. Um, that's a country study in the United States. Um, Burgess and Pandey have a study in India showing that bank, uh, bank branching in rural banks in particular uh, lowered poverty levels. So there's some reduced form evidence for this uh, financial development leading to economic development. Now, STAG is about uh, economic growth, but also structural transformation. So there's another question about what's the relationship between financial uh, development and structural transformation. And the literature that I'm aware of on this topic uh, 
is really much less in terms of formal empirical analysis, more um, correlations and or theory, some of it quantitative theory, uh, so which so has an empirical component. But I already mentioned the first one, which is if you think about the sectoral makeup of a country, finance spurs these externally financial dependent industries. Um, my, some of my own work with Paco and Yong's, uh, that finance is important for large scale sectors. So heavy manufacturing, for example, uh, when large fixed costs, large setup costs, and Virgilio and uh, Daniel Hsu's work, for example, um, finance is particularly important for that. So you might think that on both of these fronts that financial development could lead to a, a different um, composition of the economy in terms of industries and sectors. Uh, the scale of production, another important aspect of structural transformation, uh, is also impacted by investment and therefore by financial uh, development potentially. As people move from subsistence, uh, you know, small scale subsistence activities to cottage industries, to more large scale technologies, establishments, and farms. Uh, there's work on structural transformation showing that the investment boom, and a boom in investment creates a demand for manufacturing. And so when we look at the boom in manufacturing, the growth in manufacturing is associated with the growth in investment. Um, there's also a, a relationship between finance and land consolidation, uh, both, you know, agricultural finance that leads small scale farmers to be able to survive. But then, you know, you look in the history of the United States, land consolidation worked actually often through defaulting uh, and consolidating lands through banks. And then there's this, another aspect of structural transformation is formality. And so uh, finance, um, taxation and scale, all these are uh, rolled up in this. Uh, there, I've talked about some of the ma macro evidence. There's also micro evidence of financial fictions, uh, which complements the macro evidence. So we see large average spreads between borrowing and savings rates. Uh, for example, 40% in Brazil and 3% in the United States. So developing countries, these spreads are much larger. Uh, in some micro studies for different people, these they get even larger up to you know, 30 to 60%, according to Banerjee, looking across uh, 13 countries. There's high variability in spreads. Uh, Cavalcanti et al., the standard deviation of 32% uh, across borrowers after, even after controlling for default risk. So people face different spreads. Um, we find high experimental returns to capital in many countries in micro studies. So from four to five percent uh, in Sri Lanka to 33 percent in Mexico. These are monthly uh, returns. So that four to five percent is a monthly return. Firm size distributions uh, also uh, inform us about financial frictions. They tend to be smaller and there's less dispersion in, uh, firms tend to be smaller and there's less dispersion in firm size um, in poor countries. And yet we find that larger firms have a higher marginal product of capital and a higher marginal product of labor. So these larger firms may actually be the ones that are more constrained than the smaller ones. Uh, and there's a, a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, and then finally, we find very high rates of entrepreneurship. So the entry margin seems to be uh, affected. So 30%, for example, in India. And we find a large fraction of people um, in developing countries saying that they're necessity entrepreneurs. So because of the labor market not working, uh, which is uh, potentially related. Okay, so we have some evidence for aggregate impacts and aggregate impacts being sizable, but what about the mechanisms uh, what types of finance, what about frictions at the firm level and effective policies. Um, that needs some aggregate theory to inform. There's a, an, an old literature of theoretical foundations that uh, the, the more recent literature builds on and a, the, a quantitative literature uh, that allows us to map theories to data. So to uh, quantify, get quantitative answers to things. Uh, we can quantify the magnitude of potential gains to financial development, um, and we can also look at the mechanisms. Uh, so not only looking at what aggregate effects are, but do we understand those aggregate effects through the lens of theory, and can we use that theory to uh, 
understand mechanisms and inform policy. And we can use quantitative theory to run counterfactual policy simulations uh, much more cheaply than we could ever measure uh, through experiments, for example. Uh, so what's been the approach of recent quantitative theory? The models have uh, sort of common features. You usually have an entrepreneurial entry or a technology decision, some dynamic forwards looking savings decision, uh, heterogeneity and productivity, uh, uncertainty, shocks to productivity, shocks to labor, et cetera, and then introducing some forms of financial frictions. Uh, and then taking these models, these models have been mapped to developing countries. Uh, Rob and co-authors have done a lot of work in Thailand as a, a strong case study. And then there's been work that's been done in various other countries and even cross country uh, studies as well. I wish I had a clock. Paco, how much time do I have? Zero minutes. Um, what are some key, key lessons? Uh, there's debate, some of these key lessons is that the joint distribution of productivity and wealth matters. Um, persistence of productivity is an important determinant of correlation. Self-financing um, can overcome credit constraints. Uh, Self-financing, especially when the interest rate is high and productivity is persistent, meaning you, can, you have time to save and you can get a, a reasonably high rate of return on your savings, then self-financing can be effective. Uh, large firms, this heterogeneity is important. The large firms really, the financial access of the large firms drives the aggregates. There's many small firms, but the large firms are so big that they matter uh, disproportionately, obviously. Um, and then discrete decisions like fixed costs, entry costs, one-time technology costs can magnify the cost of financial frictions, okay? Um, the set of observed firms and productivities doesn't tell us the whole story, uh, in part because this entry decision is so important and these fixed costs. So where you see firms doesn't tell you where you might, where you could have seen firms, the counterfactual. I'll briefly go over some of this, the theory. Um, <clears throat> think about the, I mentioned this joint distribution of productivity and wealth or entrepreneurial ability and wealth. In a perfect world, perfect credit benchmark, the, the best uh, entrepreneurs become entrepreneurs, the people, the most productive people become entrepreneurs, the others become workers, and entrepreneurs equalize the marginal product of capital. So both the extensive and intensive margin is optimal. When you add in, financial frictions, what ends up happening is that you lose some entrepreneurs that were potentially, you know, they, were, they would have, but then now because they're poor, they're lower wealth, these guys become workers because they can't self-finance their business uh, or they can't get enough access to finance, finance their business. Yeah, nine minutes, Joe. What, how much? Nine minutes, nine, nine minutes. minutes. So okay. 37, seven and 15. Okay. Uh, in general equilibrium, what does that mean? You get some kind of uh, rich, dumb entrepreneurs uh, that kind of join to, to, to replace these guys um, <clears throat> because the wages are lower, interest rates are lower. Uh, so those guys enter. And this lowers productivity. In addition to that, you have a whole set of entrepreneurs, the guys that aren't really wealthy, but and the more productive tend to be constrained. What's the uh, aggregate impact of this? It depends on this joint distribution of ability and wealth. If all the highest productivity people are also the wealthiest productivity people, so this is like diagonal, then the fact that you have these regions doesn't matter too much. Um, but if there's something that's causing churning, it matters a lot more. Okay, let me go over a couple of these key issues. What is the type and source of frictions that firms face? Um, <clears throat> what type? We know that interest rate distortions are worse than borrowing limits because it makes it hard for firms to accumulate and self-finance. Uh, why does it, so that's an example of why the type of friction matters. Uh, why, why about the source? Why does the source of the friction matters? Well, example would be um, if, if it's a moral hazard, credit bureaus are actually quite good for solving moral hazard, but they're really bad for adverse selection because a credit bureau makes all the private information that, the, that uh, banks have public knowledge. And so nobody ever has incentives to acquire information by lending to people that they haven't uh, had before. Uh, 
So we need a lot more tests. Uh, Paulson and Townsend, Carlin and Zinman um, have done these tests, but, but the results are quite nuanced. Poverty traps, that's another big issue. How important are poverty traps? The early literature, you know what? Um, led to poverty traps at the, ma the aggregate level. The quantitative literature, you don't get them at the, the aggregate level. I realize I'm trying to go over way too much here. Um, so most of the quantitative work, you get micro traps, but not macro traps. When you add in things like forward looking behavior, intensive margins and shocks. Uh, so we need more tests for poverty traps. Uh, uh, Balboni et al. Is, a, is an example. I have some work on this as well. Uh, I'll skip some of this, okay. You know, <clears throat> we have some data needs and resources. Ideal data would be the complete joint distribution of wealth, ability, financial frictions, financial terms. It would include non-entrepreneurs. We'd have this over time in a panel so we can cover, watch, follow people. Uh, obviously those data don't and in, w will never exist. Nonetheless, we do have some useful data. Uh, firm level data is, is useful. Uh, household income data, consumption data, and asset data is useful. Financial micro and macro data. Uh, I'll make these slides available for anybody who's interested in what the data sources are that are available. We actually have an entire pathfinding paper that's writing on the data needs, micro data needs, and macro data needs. Um, so I'll skip over some of these. Let me get in, I probably have five minutes left. Avenues for future research. The main point I think is that I think we've made a lot of progress uh, in, except on this, uh, on the policy front. And I think that's true for STEG in general. We know a lot, but we don't have a lot of great policy lessons for developing countries. Uh, so I think that's an, something that we want to focus on uh, in funding research. Um, let me go over three areas, financial development, what policies lead to financial development? What are strategies for financial development? Um, if we can't, find, if poor countries can't financially develop, what are some second best policies in the face of poor financial systems? And third is uh, we're interested in inclusive growth. What's the best way to promote financial inclusion or not? Uh, in, in the case where financial inclusion might not be the best thing. So financial development policy. Uh, so we know that financial development leads to, prom to promoting development. How do we financially develop? Um, I guess one thing is being able to evaluate priorities. Should we be focusing on credit? Should we be focusing on savings? Should could countries be focusing on insurance? Uh, what's the role of bank regulation? Obviously, the, the standard ones are the capital and reserve requirements, but there's other types of regulation, competition, branching, entry, the scale of banks, the merger of banks. Uh, should you have standardized terms or not? Uh, should you allow foreign banks to enter? Should you allow foreign capital flows? These are big macro development uh, questions that, that financial development, uh, are extremely important for financial development. Uh, tax policy. Um, I, get, I mentioned, you know, the formal firms, the, basically the definition is that they pay taxes, but they also tend to have much stronger access to finance. So can tax policy increase formality and, and, and lead to financial development? Corporate governance is another one. Um, multilateral cooperation in securities markets. In general, I think developing countries are thinking how much regional cooperation should they have? Uh, second best policies. Uh, if maybe financial systems are so deeply rooted in institutions and history that financial development is gonna be too difficult. So what are some second best policies? Uh, should we subsidize credit directly? Should we use state development banks because the private sector is not going to develop on its own? Um, should we use policies that increase profits to enable firms to uh, self-finance more easily and, and accumulate capital? Anti-competitive practices, trade protection, all of these are potential policies, uh, infant industry policies. Um, should we improve labor markets? Markets for managers, markets for ideas instead. Foreign direct investment is an alternative to financing. You basically bring in, the, bring in firms with deep pockets and high productivity already. Uh, what are the, the benefits and costs of that? I think all these are extremely interesting. 
and they all have political economy concerns and the theme five is uh, very interested in that as well. Financial inclusion, it remains a major policy uh, goal. Uh, it's been studied a lot in, in the micro literature, but macroeconomics have been understudied. We know there's a lot of excluded populations, women, uh, the poor, people in remote areas, less access to financial uh, services. There's a lot of new financial services that, innovations that have abound, are abounding. Um, we find often, even when you get people access, that they don't use the services. There's issues of trust, financial literacy, risk, transaction costs. Um, as a goal, we often find that a lot of the benefits to financial services can accrue indirectly through e either GE effects or through informal um, systems. And finally, what are the distributional consequences of inclusion and non-inclusion of various groups? So that's what I have. Um, I probably went over. I apologize for that. I'm very interested. One in more minute. One uh, I've left out. What's that? One more minute. Oh, one more minute. Wonderful. Perfect, so I think perfect, perfect timing. Great. So I think there's uh, excellent work on the topic from a lot of different approaches. We're interested in seeing approaches from micro to macro, empirics to theory, quantitative work, all of this. Um, I think with the data, uh, the data in developing countries is limited. There are data, it's imperfect. You have to be resourceful in thinking about how to leverage the data that we have uh, to answer macro policy questions. But really, I think it's just an, it's an open terrain. There's a lot of work to be done on this. Uh, and we want to be able to give sound policy lessons to, from our, for our research to be able to yield policy lessons at the macro level. I think there's a lot of micro research that has policy lessons, but the macro research for development needs to be more policy focused. Um, okay, that's all I have. Perfect. Um, so we go first with Emily uh, and then Juan. I think we go seven and seven minutes. And then we have 15 minutes, I guess seven and a half and seven and a half and then 15 minutes uh, for general discussion. Okay, uh, thank you very much for asking me to, to read this. Um, the first few slides match my introductory um, lecture for an undergraduate course I teach on financial markets for the poor. Um, but then it was really useful to see the same facts shoot on through the lens of like a, a macroeconomist. And so I do think that if, if Steg could promote more discussion between the macro and the micro sides, I think it would be a huge success of, of the whole, um, of the whole uh, venture. Um, so I think one place where I, I, I saw that the, the intersection between the micro and the macro is um, especially important is in um, how the, um, how we try to figure out um, what the micro foundations are for various frictions or distortions that we see. And as Joe paper, Joe's paper lays out, he didn't have that as much time to talk about it. Um, the micro foundations really matter both for sometimes the size of the distortions in the macro models themselves. And then even if the sizes of the distortions are comparable, the policy implications might depend crucially on, on what exactly is driving those different features. And so I think if there's, uh, from, from my perspective, reading, uh, reading this kind of gave me more excitement over revisiting some of the micro questions, but with a lens to being more useful to answer some of these policy questions. And so if that could be some, if there, if there, if there could be some way to get those discussions to happen more, I think that would be really great in this, in this initiative. Um, so I just had a few thoughts about some of the specific points uh, the paper makes um, and where I thought there might be some data opportunities or crucial data limitations. Uh, or even where I would think as a more micro-oriented person, the macro side would be really useful. So I think on the first one, um, uh, developing countries are very information poor. And one of the interesting points Joe brings up in the paper um, is that misallocation might be much more severe when there's a really large wedge between the borrowing rate and the savings rate. Um, and we don't have that much information about what explains that spread. And so I think, um, it might be the case that some types of entrepreneurs are just harder to learn about and that can and that can lead to some of this where you have a decoupling between the spread and actual default. So this might subsidize weak businesses in a pooling equilibrium or, or make the market unravel altogether for some segments. And I think there's some very promising micro evidence on the benefits of screening in credit contracts. Um, I think 
notably uh, Reshma, Hassam, Natalia Rigal, and Ben Roth's paper shows that there's a lot of information already in communities and maybe lenders just don't have incentives to unlock that. Um, I have some evidence that in microfinance, where on average things don't look so great, when targeted appropriately, microfinance actually has some meaningful impacts. Um, and so I think you know there, there's a big trend going forward for lenders to get better access to data, alternative data sources, and agriculture. One example is using remote sensing to try to give state contingent agricultural loans. So I think there might be some really interesting, more macro level shocks to information that could be useful. Or from a policy perspective, where should governments encourage people to use alternate data sources to invest in these? And when could those actually be counterproductive? So I think that's one potentially interesting marriage between the macro and the micro. I also agree with a point that Joe makes um, that our best empirical evidence is on the micro empirical evidence is on the far left tail of the firm distribution, but that's not necessarily what's the engine of, of growth. Um, and so I do think that that's a big data limitation. Um, and to the extent that more work could be encouraged, even on the micro level across the um, firm size distribution, I think that's a huge hole in, in our existing evidence. Um, so then a couple of other things. I know that the, the whole point of this is to think about growth, but I guess I had a couple of other, and a structural transformation, but I guess I had a couple of other directions that I, I had some questions about. So first, um, I'm very interested in, in the role of the formal financial sector on fluctuations. So even if growth isn't necessarily the first order, there could be very interesting interactions there. Excess volatility in macro conditions is going to disproportionately hurt the poor who are likely more risk averse and a few way, fewer ways to smooth shocks. It could affect the selection into entrepreneurship and then tie back into all of these questions that, that Joe highlights here. Moreover, um, I think one interesting area of, of work is regulatory policy. A lot of developing countries ignore the regulation of financial products for the poor because they don't really think that they move the needle or they overregulate them. And, and, and I think this can just cause like very, very large um, disruptions that actually do have equilibrium implications. Um, and so that, that is something that policymakers I think need to be much more aware of before they decide what, you know, how do they even decide what's under their purview in their regulatory frameworks. Um, and then in many countries, financial development for entrepreneurship and firms comes hand in hand with development of consumer credit markets. So we see in middle income countries, high rates of consumer debt. How does this, if this is happening at the same time as the expansion of the, the, the formal financial market um, for firms, do those different aspects have interesting interactions with one another? Um, should they be studied together or is, is separating them okay? Um, I guess like then, um, I think uh, in my last two minutes, circling back to just the policy relevance of all of this. What I really have enjoyed from the micro perspective about reading Joe's papers with his co-authors and, and other work in this space is that these aggregate analyses really force us to contemplate uh, all of the potential costs of targeted policies that we might overlook in partial equilibrium and to try to help us think about magnitudes of these things. So giving us an accounting of winners and losers. I think there's been some successful work in the case of um, targeted subsidies and uh, targeted credit in India. Martin Rotenberg has a really nice paper showing some evidence of the redistribution that happens when uh, small firms are, are given a leg up in terms of credit, but I think there's a lot more uh, that can be done there. Um, and again, a very nice marriage between the micro and the macro. Uh, and then I guess my last point, um, is uh, that policymakers really do need to be aware of interactions between formal financial sector expansion and what's already there in the background. And so as Joe's paper alludes to, his talk alluded to, um, people aren't completely uh, unfinanced. They might be unbanked, but there are active markets for informal loans, for informal risk sharing, et cetera. Um, and so there's been some research recently showing that you know, maybe some of the, you know, the, the disappointing impacts of microfinance has just been because for a lot of people, it's just crowding out what was there before. On the other hand, policies like mobile money in Kenya crowd in risk sharing. So it's a very nuanced set of questions about, you know, when formal financial market expansion, when financial policy is going to be a substitute or a complement with what's there already. And I do think a lot more macro structure could help us think about those policy uh, trade-offs. Um, and so then I guess, you know, just concretely for Steg, and I'm happy, Joe, to talk offline, um, I think it would be really nice if this could give micro-researchers a way to think about how their research ideas 
plug into these broader macro models because it seems like in some ways there might be small tweaks to the research design that could make it much more useful for, for the macro economist consumer. Um, and I, I'm not sure how to actually implement this in practice. Um, perhaps that's something that would need to be part of, you know, the call. Um, I know in, in the IGC and pedal review processes that I've taken, uh, that I participated in, there's sometimes when the committee actually gives advice uh, or steers the paper in one direction or another. So I think that could also be quite helpful. And so any, anything that could help the micro person make research that's more useful, I think would be a huge success. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Emily. It's a lot of food for thought. Uh, Juan? Yes. Uh, I'm keep share, on discussing uh, after Juan. Yeah. I'm going to share my uh, slides. Uh, can you see them? Okay. Perfect. Yeah, can see them. Yeah, so I made just some slides because I'm not as good as Emily to discuss the paper without slides. So, uh, so let me you know, what is in green, this, these are quotes that I took from um, Joe's paper. This is just to summarize, summarize what I, I think about uh, the, the literature that we, that we have contributed. So uh, this slide is basically saying that, you know, that in, the first, in, the, in the first paper, um, uh, there is an emphasis on, uh, on self-financing and how the firm's if productivity is, uh, is, is very, very persistent. Self-financing may be uh, like a very strong force to overcome uh, the problems of financial development. So in that sense, for maybe for most of the business, uh, financial development is not going to be um, uh, such, uh, or financial development is not going to be that important to determine the level of, um, of, of output. But on the fifth comment that uh, uh, Joe's uh, right, I think, and, and I think that's something that we, I guess we, we agree, is that financial development become more important when there is uh, something related to discrete decisions like fixed cost, entry cost, uh, or, or technology cost. So it could be like adoptions and in Tommaso's uh, paper yesterday, you know, uh, it could be uh, sectorial uh, allocations as in the paper of Joe. Um, um, no, in our paper, we focus on, on type of ventures. Uh, I'll show you a bit more about that. Um, so that's that. That's basically, um, you know, like what I think the literature is. So what I'm going to do now, you know, in this in the few minutes, is to give you a few examples or of, of where we benefited from uh, empirical uh, literature uh, in our papers. And you know, I say a little bit how how we use it. Uh, in a meeting that it was, I don't know, maybe ten years ago at MIT, some of uh, of you were here, there, like Townsend organized it. Uh, I, I was sitting there with a, with a previous paper, and we saw this picture uh, from the paper of Shea and Clino about the uh, the life uh, and 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 that motivated our paper, you know, our 2016 paper on trying to understand. So this picture basically show the average employment uh, of firms in the U.S., in Mexico, uh, and India. You see that in India, you know, firms that are less than five year old compared to firms that are more than 35 year old, they are like maybe. 40% larger, what in the U.S. is an order of 10, you know, much larger. So we so motivated by this picture, and we, we use some of this data that, that we got from, uh, from them directly to uh, calibrate our model. Uh, we wrote a paper, and we, we show that um, if entrepreneurs are faced with um, different stochastic processes, that one could give you a profile like the U.S. and the other a profile like India, just by changing some frictions that... Uh, that has to do with financial development, uh, you could have the entrepreneur choosing uh, something like India or something like the US. So something like the US in financial development is better. So it was really motivated by a, a, a conference like this one in which uh, we learn about our data. So what, what I want to say, and, what I, and here we, you know, I, I, we think of this as an adoption of technology. And that's what I said in my first slide, and, and that's what I wanted to get here. So, so how do uh, firms in the U.S. that have like a really high growth, how are they financed? Well, in the U.S., they are financed with something that uh, is called venture capital. You know, so I have there a table with all the companies that were uh, backed by uh, venture capital in the U.S., the top 30. And you see, you can recognize most of them. So financing gets very difficult when you are talking about things like this. You know, projects that you, they need a lot of investment at the beginning. It's, it's impossible to, to think that you are going to, uh, going to sell finance 
something like that. Venture capital on average gave, give 10 million to these firms and they are like really very risky. Only a few of them will succeed and it, it will take time. So financing is really difficult and really uh, important for this type of project. So this is why I think, you know, when we think of financial development, focusing on this, this kind of, um, of fact is really, really important. And, and, and the last uh, slide that I, that I prepared is a, a little bit on the, on the sources of financial frictions. You know, Joe also talked about this. There is less uh, in, uh, work in understanding where the source of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, financial frictions are coming from. So in our papers, we use difference in monitoring, uh, enforcement, and venture capital is very important, evaluation, and also development efficiency. So venture, venture capital, um, they really help the firm, you know, find, find, find a path. So all, all these we have found in the different papers that, uh, that they are important. So in terms of the connection with the empirical paper, and, and I'll finish with this. So there is a, a paper in the Journal of Finance by Bernstein, Giro, and, and, and Townsend that uh, they basically estimate, it's an IV estimation of uh, how a change in the cost of monitoring affects the investment that venture capital do in firms. It's basically, venture capital have to travel to different uh, cities to provide uh, evaluation and advice to different firms. And they say, what when there are new flights in between the city? This is gonna change, you know, before you had to do one connection, now there is no connection, so that changes the time and they, they use that to estimate. And in our paper on venture capital, you know, we, we have one elasticity in the model that is how monitoring uh, changes, where, how investment changes with monitoring cost change. So we use that elasticity estimated there to discipline our model. So I think all this, uh, and, and to conclude with this, uh, the, the interaction with, uh, of macro research with um, more empirical research is very, very uh, important to, uh, to discipline our model and to learn about uh, the facts. So thank you very much. And yes, I'm, I'm the last one here. Like, thank you very much to uh, the organizers for putting this uh, conference together. I learned a lot. So, yeah. Thank you. So I guess we're open now for a, a general discussion on on uh, Joe's presentation or the or, or the or the responses. But Joe, yeah, can I just I'll just quickly respond. Yeah. Uh, just saying thanks. Uh, it was a little self-serving that I actually sent the emails to invite Emily and Juan. So I chose my own discussions. You don't get a chance to do that very often, but I know you guys would do a great job. And and I thank you. I, that's all I have to say. Is, uh, yes, I have a question for Emily. Uh, if, and let's give time for people to think in questions and uh, criticism to Joe and, uh, and anger to Joe. But before that, so uh, you, you mentioned uh, evidence on uh, on the crowd out of traditional finance from microfinance. I thought the, the, the earlier uh, early literature, I mean, uh, some of your contribution stressed the fact that microfinance gave a uh, a net increase in credit? Uh, so um, I think the initial um, miracle of microfinance paper showed an increase in microcredit, a very large first stage. I think overall the yeah. increase so in total credit. Be, it, it increase on the net, no? Yeah, on the net, I think it's somewhat small. Um, okay. And so the, 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 uh, if we go back and look at that data set, um, and there are similar results in a natural experiment in Karnataka, um, the heterogeneity is super important. So um, I guess there's heterogeneity in kind of two related ways. So one is, um, did you have a pre-existing business? Um, if you didn't have a pre-existing business, it was one for one crowd out. It did, it did nothing. I see. Um, so if, you, if you did have a pre if you did have a pre-existing business, it actually crowded in informal finance, which we think is actually an important reason why we see such large impacts. Um, I think the other thing that we've done, um, and this matches the results from Karnataka, is we can, we can uh, try to predict who's actually gonna borrow in the first place. And we see that the people who don't borrow are very unlikely to borrow from microcredit actually lose informal finance when microcredit comes in. And that's consistent with um, upsetting the, village level market for risk sharing and so there actually are negative impacts on some and those people are actually less able to smooth consumption perfect i guess in, i guess in everything is always 
you, you get some message for the initial in, in initial paper and then there's a follow up that it takes time for the non non connoisseurs to uh, to catch up that, that that's me but what paper is this that you were mentioning emily um, I can send them both to you. So, so one of them is just about the long run impacts of um, microcredit, and then there's another one about net how networks change. And we have a we have a um, some that paper uh, that has the two Carnatic and Hyderabad examples, um, okay. and we run some risk sharing regressions there too. I was going to follow up with a couple different questions about about papers you mentioned. Absolutely. Do we have any other questions? Maybe I'll read one that was sent. Uh, to me, and it says to build. Unless the, the person that sent it to me wants to to build on Mrs. Braze's and on Ms. Braze's sorry, uh, feedback, I wonder whether further research would be fruitful on providers of finance banks, microfinance managers, and officers' norms and values, behavior and practices targeting SMEs and farmers. This is based on my practice as a designer and re reviewer of FCDO funded programs. There was some work done a few years ago by the excellent Pakistan Microfinance Network on frontline loan officers. Um, you have any thoughts on that, Emily? Can you say the last part one more time? It's, the, it's basically uh, the um, research on officers, bank managers, and officers, their norms and values, and and their behavior in targeting SMEs and farmers. Yeah, I think I think broadly the regulatory question of how uh, you know what is the regulator's role, what is their you know how do you ensure consumer protection in settings where um, it's just really hard to monitor anybody is of first order importance, and I don't think we have much to say about it. Um, I think the regulator's response in India in a few cases has been to shut the whole enterprise down and that has some very, very costly consequences. Um, so I think that it's a very open question that, and I'd love to see more work on that. Uh, Rocco, you want to just uh, unmute? I think, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, my connect, hello everybody. My connection is not very good. So is the, I've written the question in the chat that I was just Perfect. wondering whether Joe and Emily can elaborate a bit more on the links between the financial development theme that Joe spoke about and other stack themes, in particular the role of agriculture in financial development in the structural transformation. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll take that first. I mean, I I tried to touch a little bit on these things um, in the sense that I was talked about how finance. I I think uh, it's interesting because. <laughs> I work on finance and I work on structural transformation. Uh, the empirical work on the two is more limited. Uh, I mean, actually my colleague, Taryn Dinkelman uh, has some work on it. Paula Bustos has some work on sort of where finance uh, does lead to structural transformation, uh, moving people out of agriculture and uh, into uh, industry or services. Um, but sort of like the cross, the large scale research, the macro research, empirical research is, I, I don't, is fairly limited on this. I think there's a lot of channels. Uh, obviously, agricultural banks exist. Um, I, I mentioned the, the, you know, agricultural banks you might think uh, could keep people in agriculture um, by making small, depending on how it's channeled, by making small scale farming uh, more or less. Uh, you know, profitable. Uh, it could also lead to increases in productivity that through, you know, regular transfer, structural transformation processes, increase productivity and push people out of agriculture. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap there. And I see a lot of overlap with the, uh, so that's the agriculture is a theme and the uh, political economy for sure, I see because, you know, finance is a highly centralized uh um you know i mean it's it's wealthy people and yet there's populism so i'm sure there's a, a big interactions with the um with political economy in all of these things especially when it comes to regulation that um we've talked about so 
And one other thing, just that this is not taking off my hat as the pathfinding paper author and putting it on as one of the academic leads. Um, the themes are there to sort of guide people, but the themes are not really segmented. There's a lot of things that don't fit into one theme so clearly. And when it comes to the process of submitting, I would never let the, you know, if it doesn't fit into one theme, that doesn't mean we're not interested. I would just probably choose the person, people associated with the theme that you think are gonna be the most promising to choose which one to submit to. Okay, sorry, Emily, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just, I, I totally agree with what Joe said. I, I think that um, the standard banking paradigm works a lot better for agriculture than for non-agriculture, uh, or at least small scale non-agriculture. Um, the little bit I've poked around, it seems that at least in Thailand, where the, the BAAC, the Government Bank for Agricultural Development, is, um, seems to be quite well run, uh, it's easy to, to, to let get lend collateral using land as collateral, um, but the other stuff's a lot harder. So I feel like Joe, what Joe said is exactly right. It might keep people in agriculture. And um, I think the financial innovation is more needed in the other stuff that's where the production function's a little harder to understand and where the collateral isn't quite as uh, easy to deal with. If, if I can just jump in, I think the, I think the question of what, role financial constraints play in keeping smallholder agriculture from expanding, which I'm guessing uh, with a question coming from Rocco, I think there's a really interesting set of issues there. I, I suspect that in the sub-Saharan African context, finance is not the main constraint to smallholders expanding. It's about market opportunities and various other things. But I think looking, I think there's a real payoff to looking um, at the impact of financial constraints, not not just within the context of smallholder farming, but really looking at the more commercial producers and looking at, um, right, I think we have lots of evidence on financial constraints or the combination of finance and insurance for smallholders, much less about farmers who are in a position perhaps to make larger investments in capital. Right? Most of the microfinance stuff for African agriculture seems to focus on really limited um, capital inputs. It, it's often not even capital, it's chemical inputs which don't have a long lasting effect. And, and thinking about the bigger picture questions around you know, how you go from having smallholder operation to, um, having, to having a tractor, right? That I think we have very little evidence on because the interventions have been sized fairly small. So I think there's a lot of open questions there partly about scale, partly about industrial organization within the agricultural sector and around processing and trucking and, and things like that. So I think, there's a, I think there's an agenda there and I think not too much work that's being done. So maybe connecting we should the, kick it back to Rocco. Connecting the dots to, between the two, between Emily's and yours. I mean, I also think that land titling and land markets uh, in relation to structural transformation and agriculture and f I mean, a land's collateral, when you have land markets, uh, that, that <laughs> when you have a title and active land markets is a much better collateral. So it might be like a necessary condition for financial development. And it might be the wealthy land owners that are the more likely to be moving into, um, you know, agribusiness, but also other uh, types of development projects. Rocco? No, thanks. I, 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 yeah, thanks, Joe, and thanks, Emily, and also thanks, Doug. I agree. I, I fully agree with what Doug mentioned. Um, there is, I think, there is work on finance for smallholder farmers, finance broadly defined, with, you know, insurance, saving, credit, and so forth. I think there is less work on, uh, yeah, how do you create or, uh, you know, larger farms or uh, how do larger firms that, operate, that are relevant for uh, agriculture. Um, operate and uh, 